Okay, so um, thank you for coming to my talk and thank you for the invitation. So I'm going to talk about one of um, our most recent work on analyzing encoded concepts in transformer language models. So here is the, the awesome team behind, behind the work and I'm just one part of the puzzle. So, okay, so let's start with something more about um, the motivation that deep neural network models have achieved state-of-the-art performance uh, for most of the um, NLP and vision task. But one of the problem is, is their opaqueness. They work as a black box and we don't know how, what the model has learned about the language and how it comes to solve a problem or to understand a problem. So interpretation is important because we want to understand the models, but at the same time, we want to have more trust on the A systems that they are, they are making a decision based on fairness and so it supports ethical decision making as well. So I will first start with a couple of definitions, which I'm gonna then keep on using the rest of the, of the talk. So first is what, what is interpretation? Um, there are various ways you can, you can define it. It's a, it's a big area. Uh, so here in this talk, what I mean by, or when I refer to interpretation is, I want to know what knowledge does a model learn to solve a problem? And if you want to, elaborate this question, you can say maybe is this knowledge similar to what humans rely on, like linguistic knowledge, morphology, syntax, or is it completely unexpected or unintuitive? So the second one definition I'm going to go through is, is a concept, which I'll keep talking about it. So according to stock, a class containing certain objects has elements where objects have certain properties, they call it concept. So in, in, in our work and in you can say in NLP we define concept as a group of words that are meaningful and where meaningful can be based on maybe a linguistic relation like lexical semantic syntactic or any other relation that maybe we don't know but when any group of words where we can find a meaningful relation for example if if I want to say what is a concept according to our um, core linguistic um, categories, we can say part of speech tags, each tag is a concept where all of these words are grouped together based on, on, on a morphological property. And you can also think of a lexical concept like words with a common suffix like less. All of these words, they have a, they have a, have a coherent relationship. That's why they, they will be called as a concept. Okay. So, then the definition of interpretation, and I want to say it in terms of concept, I want to know what language concepts does a model learn to, model learn to solve a pro problem? And are these concepts similar, similar to what humans rely on? Okay. So uh, most of the interpretation studies, um, when they want to ask this question, like do neural network models implicitly learn some linguistic concepts? They, they look at morphology, syntax, semantics, and there is one common approach, which is, which is called a post hoc classifier or probing classifier, which is that they, they train um, a linear classifier or, or a, um, a simple classifier for the, pro, for the concept of interest. For example, given we have this neural network model, and I want to learn whether my model has learned the, the, the concept of proper nouns. So what they do in this, in this approach is they have annotated data of like in sentences, they have annotations of all of the proper nouns. So they, they do a forward pass of this data, extract the representations of proper nouns. So here in Doha, they will extract these activations and they, they will use them as feature in a linear classifier. Now, and, and they will train the classifier to predict proper nouns. And according to this method, the performance of the classifier is, it is a proxy that tells you how much the knowledge of proper noun is learned in, in this representation. And they do this exercise on all of the layers separately. And then based on the performance, they can say this layer has learned more about proper nouns. And overall, this is, has been a very successful method. And there, there, there are like tons of papers on it. And, and these, their findings suggest that the model inherits or model learns linguistic knowledge in different parts of the network. 
But there are, there are a few issues with this approach. So because we are using supervised data, then we are also using a classifier. We are training the classifier. Then we are using rich representation. So when a classifier performs well, is it really that the representations have the knowledge of the linguistic structure, or is it because of the supervision or the power of the classifier that it will learn any of the task? And there have been numerous papers trying to, to tackle this, um, these issues. But at the broader level, there's um, another um, drawback or limitation, I would say, of these approaches is that the analysis is limited to human defined concepts. Like we know part of morphology or part of speech tagging, semantics, syntax, we have these tags and we want to ask the model, do you learn about this? So here we are, we are really biased in our interpretation of the model, or we, are, we want to have the interpretation of the model from our own perspective. What we know about the world, we want to answer the model whether they also know about this world. But we are unable to prove the model or to ask the model what kind of novel language concepts is it learning. Like maybe model is not strictly following the part of speech category, categories. Maybe it's learning something more diverse. So in this talk, um, I will present um, a method that works on, that looks at the interpretation of the model from its own perspective, what model look into the language. And, and so, so we identify encoded concepts. We call them encoded concepts that are learned in representations in, in, in an unsupervised way. So the way we discover the concepts have no relationship with any of the human defined concepts. Okay, so the hypothesis uh, of our methodology is words group together in higher dimensional space and form a latent concept. So, um, so latent and encoded concepts, I'm, I'm, I'll keep using them alternatively, but they refer to the same thing. So, 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 so our hypothesis is that when you, you train a model, words, words group together in higher dimensional space, and each of these space represents a latent concept about the language. So what we do is, or what we did is, we cluster contextualize representations in higher dimensional space, and then we analyze them by manually annotating those concepts, the encoded concepts, or we align them with the suite of human defined concepts just to answer the question whether the model learns about linguistic concepts, human defined concepts, or they have their own, own learning about the language. Okay, so, just to reiterate, we have a pre-trained model. We, we have a, a, a large um, set of like sentences. We give these sentences to the model. We are not training the model. We just give this, we take a pre-trained model. We just give the sentences. We extract the activations from different layers of the model. For every layer, we um, um, layer representations, we run clustering um, on the contextualized embedding. So well, the, 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 the meaning of contextualize is every word occurrence based on the context will have a different representation. And it will, uh, it will rely, depending on its context, it may end up in different clusters. Then once we have these clusters, we manually annotate them or we align them with human defined concepts to, to really understand how the model has, has, has developed its latent space for this for the language. Again, more formally, you can say we have a neural network model M with L encoder layers. We have a sentence from a S from a data set. We have all of these words. So for every word, we extract a contextualized representation from each of the layer. So for this, and these are represented as, for every layer represented as ZL. And our goal is that we want to cluster ZL to discover latent concepts. And we refer to latent concepts as C, LC is latent concept, and N it will be the number of words in each of this cluster. We'll keep on repeating this uh, later on as well. Okay. Um, okay. So we 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 did experiments on um, a large number of twelve-layer pre-trained models. Uh, we use hierarchical clustering uh, to um, 
um, to, to cluster um, contextualized representations, uh, which uses like words, minimum variance criterion uh, that minimizes the total in, within cluster variance. Um, the, the choice of hierarchical clustering is, is, is a critical here. Like someone can think of like, why, why can't we use k-means? Um, or something there. because here the the boundary what we are expecting is very irregular. We and we are not expecting circular like very rounded boundaries, and that's why hierarchical clustering is is critical to to this step. Then one of the um, one of the um, the parameter that clustering has is the number of clusters. Uh, we experimented with several standard methods like elbow or silhouette to find the number of clusters, but they, they were very um, unreliable uh, in, in this context of the problem. Mm, but we did experiments on, on a thorough, like from 200 to 1600 number of clusters, and we found them, them like our results were always consistent. So mostly then we limit ourselves to 600 and 1000 number of clusters. And here each cluster represents a concept. Okay, so this is just an example. Like we cluster them, we get a lot of these, these concepts. Here, when I say this is C, a latent concept, which has N is the number of words in the concept. Now the, the problem comes, how can we interpret these, these clusters? We can see something, maybe something meaningful, but how can we interpret them? So first step that we, we did is we manually annotate them. And then I will go into the details of what kind of interesting clusters or the phenomena we have found that the model is learning about, about, uh, about the language. So yeah, so we did manual annotation just to study the relationship behind uh, each group. So we devised a, a annotation platform where well, we, we have two questions. First question is, is the cluster meaningful? And annotator can hover over the words and they can, and when they hover over the words, they can see in which context these words are appearing. This is very important when they want to annotate these clusters because maybe a cluster does not make sense when you just look at it, but maybe they are just the first word cluster. So it's important to have a relationship with the actual occurrence of the word in the corpus. And when um, an annotator says it's, it's, it's a meaningful cluster, then they have to annotate it. And I will go into the details of how, what kind of concept labels or from where the label comes. But this is the first question to identify meaningful clusters and what kind of relation they are describing. Then the second question we had in the annotation was, can these two clusters be combined to form a meaningful cluster? These are two sibling clusters. Remember in hierarchical clustering at every level, you, you split one of the branch to, to, into two. So if two clusters are sibling, which means they have the same parent, we wanted to know like whether you, we can clearly see that the, the hierarchical clustering has split them based on a specific reason, or it's just that um, based on some of the variants, it decided to split them into two pieces. Okay, so now comes the concept label part. Concept labels, like how we assign the labels. It, the label labeling method was developed during the initial phase of the annotation when we were doing all the tests test a pilot and annotations. So, and so consider we have a group of words, I'm again referring to one concept, latent concept, that mentioned first word, first name of the football players of the German team. And all of the, the, the names occur at the start of a sentence. So this, I, and I'll show you that we were getting this fine grain kind of categorization of concepts in the latent space. Now, how can we label them? You see, it is very fine grained information. So, so we, we wanted to capture all of this information. So we, we have, we annotated a cluster with a series of, of, um, of labels. So every cluster may have one too many, many labels. So for example, we have, we define a hierarchy that for it, one is hierarchy is like semantics, which is the origin and origin is Germany. But then about the, then it's about sports. When specific to football, then we have named entity, person, but they are all the first names. And all of them have a syntactic relationship that they are coming as first word in a sentence. So our annotations have all of these fine grain multifaceted annotations of, of these classes. So that we can really understand um, how the model is 
is uh, capturing all of these phenomena in the latent space. This is just another way to look at the, the concept hierarchy that we are preserving in the annotation. That you can imagine, see we have three clusters in the example, 184, 865, 297. Each cluster has have two words in them. And we can all see that all of these words are proper nouns. And this is what the information that you we can get from our human defined concepts that that they are proper nouns. WordNet doesn't have named entities. So this is a max information we can get from based on our human defined concepts. Uh, so what we how we annotate is we preserve all of the information that these are actors, then these actors are celebrities, and then they are players. So if a person wants to analyze um, this annotated data set, they can analyze at any level of the annotation. Okay. So now comes the, the, um, the interesting part. Now I'll just show some, some of the examples um, um, that, that when, when we annotate, how, what kind of multifaceted information is there. Uh, for example, here, this is, these are named ent entities which are very specific to German. And you can see that the model is learning for every region. It's very specific named entities. Uh, then here is an example where you can see that it, these are all hyphenated uh, words, but at the same time, they are also adjectives in terms of our part of speech tags, but they are also representing a semantic meaning, which is the age. So, so one concept has like three different, um, three different properties to describe the concept. And in, in our annotation, we preserve all of this. But the interesting part is the model is combining all of the different dimensions of our linguistic knowledge into to form these latent spaces. This is another interesting um, um, concept where you have or demographic information. So these are sibling um, uh, concepts. Um, so they have the same parent, not parent, but they will combine into one one uh, um, uh, one concept at one uh, level up. So here, these are all names that are from Arab region, and these are all names or the common names that are coming from more like Indian subcontinent. So, so the model is able to distinguish about these finer differences between different words based on their geographical. Um, uh, geographic regions. Uh, this is one of my favorite one, um, where the model is able to distinguish different features or the names of the animals based on their properties. Like these are flying animals. It's a very separate concept or the flying animals properties like their um, their, their body parts kind of uh, their features. Then these are sea animals and then we have land animals. And you can see that if we really trust our models, eventually a unicorn will also be an animal for us. Um, I think this, this must be coming from, uh, from like fiction uh, stories, things like that. But it's interesting that the model is building its own ontology, um, which is complementary as well to the linguistic concept. At the same time, it may like, um, it can add some additional value. Like, um, this is another interesting one. So um, these are again, sibling concepts. So they were split into two uh, concepts. One is US rock, rock bands, another is US UK rock bands. So, so the model knows that these are all rock bands and then later on, it splits them into geographical differences. Similarly, we were able to find very clear concepts of classic bands versus rock bands. And, and again, to remind um, you, we, did, we are not training the model on this data. We are just giving an input of, so we, we, we did not do any selection on the input one. We just took a, a, a huge news corpus and we randomly select sentences from it and we just uh, pass it to the model. So, so the model has the information about this. Okay, so here is another example where you see all of both of these concepts are floating point uh, numbers. But 
um, when we look at the context syntactically, they are completely different. All of these numbers appear as percentages in, in, the, in, the, um, in the corpus. And all of these numbers come as monetary figures, like 9.6 billion or 2.4 million dollars. So the, so the model knows that these are numbers, which is a very standard, our part of speech category, then, but then it splits into floating point numbers, then it further split into the syntactic differences between different floating point numbers. Okay. So, um, so we we um, we introduce we are releasing this um, these annotations. We only did it for Word, uh, for one of the layer. It's, it's an expensive process, but um, but these annotations are are very rich in terms of the each concept provide multiple information. And, and remember, each of the word in each of the concept has an associated sentence level context. So it's, you can imagine this similar to a part of speech tagging data set. But here, each of the annotation, whatever are there, they are much richer than what we can get from one of or, or by combining all of our um, um, human defined uh, categories. And the words that we did not annotate, we, they will just occur as um, NA in the corpus. So we have, the corpus has 174 unique concept labels. And we labeled 279 clusters. Um, okay, now that was the part where we manually annotate and try to understand what is happening in the latent space of the model. Now the question comes: All our life, we have been talking about that. That let's prove the model based on the linguistic uh, concepts that we already know. So, do these latent concepts represent linguistic hierarchy? Okay, so. To answer this, we, we define a suite of human defined concepts that let's have a large range of many different variety of concepts, like we have lexical concepts, uh, first word should be syntactic, yeah. Casing, um, like we have engram, subword, suffix, prefix, part of speech, semantic tags, syntactic tags. We have word net. LIWC, which are psychologically meaningful categories. So what we are trying to do is we want to see which of these human defined concepts are learned by our model, which are represented in the latent space of our model. So, so in order to, to answer this, we align these concepts with the latent concepts. And the alignment score reflects the amount of linguistic hierarchy learned in the model. In, in, in the model. So just to refresh our, our figure, we, we extract the latent concepts and then we align them with different um, human defined concepts. So more formally, how the alignment works is, um, suppose we have this latent concept and we consider a latent concept to be successfully aligned to a human defined concept if 95% of its unique words are part of the human defined concepts. So, and why we are based on unique words, because it's possible that you just have a concept that only have all the kinds of the same word, like the, the is so frequent that it may end up in, in its own, own uh, latent concept. So we wanted to keep the diversity in the concept. That's why we are matching the unique words in a concept with the human defined concept. So for example, let's, uh, flying birds we just saw is one of our latent concept and it has these words. Now we have a part of speech noun concept that has table, car, hand, and many, many more words. So we, 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 we check the overlap of the latent concept in the, in the noun concept. And if this, this latent concept is covered more, um, uh, almost 95% of the time, we will say this latent concept represents a, a noun, a human, a noun a human defined concept. Okay, so first we say how many latent concepts align with, with all of the human defined concepts in combination? So we, when we extract the latent concepts of every layer, we combine all of these latent concepts. Not combine doesn't mean we combine the clusters, but we 
we just say from every layer, suppose we get 600 and we have 13 layers. So now we have 13 into 600 latent concepts. And then we align them with all of the human defined concepts, irrespective of whether it's it's a, it's a concept of boss or a semantic or word, word net or something. We just wanted to see what is the overall um, alignment. And here you can see a few notable things are that multilingual models have higher alignment than monolingual models, and it's substantially higher. Another thing is BERT uncased, where the casing information is, is, it's, is missing, is aligned better than the BERT case model. So our hypothesis is here that harder the task is, higher is the alignment with linguistic concepts. For example, in the case of multilingual uh, models, the model has to optimize several languages. So it's, it's a harder task. Similarly, in the case of case versus uncased, um, when you remove the casing information, you are making the task harder for the, for the model because um, casing is important for the model to learn about named entities um, or even a start of a sentence kind of information. So, so how do the task higher alignment likely to get with the linguistic concepts? Then we look at concept-wise alignment. So here um, um, you can see in the y-axis, we have all of uh, are the most common human defined concepts that we, uh, we align. And these are the models. So again, some of the notable things. This is an example of, of an n-gram uh, um, concept. So here um, you can see um, that n-grams are substantially learned like higher in the multilingual models. This is substantially more than the rest of the monolingual models. Um, so we, we, we probe this like, why is it happening? And, and the, one of the reason is because of the subword based vocabulary. Because the, the vocabulary of subword vocabulary has, um, is, is very limited. So in monolingual, it's around 32K. Um, and in, in multilingual, it's, it's in the range of 50 to 100K. So the problem is when you, they learn the subword vocabulary uh, on across hundreds of languages, then when the input comes, it has to split into very, very small subword units. So those subword units get dominated in the initial layers of the model. And then the model learned to, to, to have more of this kind of n-gram based relationship in the initial layers of the model and combine the words based on this n-gram relationship. And then later the, the thing change. And, and I'll, I'll get to that. Okay, so uh, this is another example of, um, of part of speech where we have um, past tense of the verb as a cluster. Um, both pause and sem are learned or represented in the, in the latent space, but, but pause is substantially better represented than the semantic tagging uh, task. Um, yeah, and, and uh, again, another interesting thing is uh, the multilingual models have higher learning of morphology uh, compared to the uh, monolingual model. And similarly, the BERT uncased has better mapping with the uh, boss than the BERT case. So this brings back to our, our previous hypothesis that the, the difficult, it, it may depend on the difficulty of the task. Mm, that the model learn more about the morphology of the of the language. Okay, um, another notable um, um, alignment is for WordNet and LIWC. Here you can see that the it, it's um, an example of a WordNet cluster which is aligned with the WordNet uh, uh, concept of quantity. You can see it has all of the quantities in it, and this is an example of the. Um, Luke um, religion uh, concept. So both Luke and WordNet are, are quite well represented in the latent space. And interestingly, WordNet is the second top uh, in all of the human defined concepts that we considered. Um, 
Um, so it means um, that in addition to the morphology, the model is also learning or modeling this, this uh, modeling the words based on their semantic relationships. So this semantic tagging is it's lexical semantics. It's very different from from the semantics um, of WordNet, um, which are purely dependent on the semantics of the words. Uh, um, yeah. Okay. Okay. Now we we want to understand how these um, latent concepts evolve across the layers. So we have seen their matching across the full model, but now we want to see whether they are differ, they are, they differently evolve in different layers of the model. And this is a um, um, figure from a multilingual bird. The y-axis is, um, is normalized matches and axes are uh, the number of uh, or each layer. So let's start with, with the lexical match. Uh, you can see that in the beginning, we see very high matches for engram and suffixes, which as we said, is because of the uh, domination of engram uh, subword uh, segmentation. And interestingly, casing goes up more like in the in the nine to ten layers. So the the model starts evolving or start evolving the latent space more towards the casing of the uh, in 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 the higher layers. And later we we observe that this is not just because of casing, but it was learning the named entities in the higher layers. And most of the named entities were um, were capitalized as they should be. So that's why we saw casing more in higher in the higher layers. Then the linguistic ontologies, WordNet and um, LIWC, you can see that they, they, they are mainly learned or, or, the, or the space is mainly presented more as in the, uh, in the initial layers. And then it goes um, uh, down like um, in the higher layers of the model. So in the in the, in the beginning, um, I think that the reason of having low matches of WordNet is because of the domination of the subword based units. Like in in Word uh, in uh, Word two we have seen that um, which is just the embedding layer. We have seen that the words are um, come together based on the on the semantic relations. Then the interesting part another is uh, that all of the uh, the core linguistic concepts, pause, semantic, syntactic, they are mainly like they're, um, they have the top match or the latent space is mostly representing them in the higher, higher layers, but not the last two or three layers. Uh, so the, and, and the reason of last two layers for the decline for all the con, uh, concept is, that it's 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 a well known phenomenon that the model the last layers of the model are optimized for the objective function, so uh, whatever is the output of the model, the latent space will evolve into um, optimizing the the objective function. Okay, so so based on this, we can we can talk about the evolution of knowledge that the initial layers could first based on their lexical and semantic similarities. And with the inclusion of context and abstraction in the higher layers, these groups evolve into linguistic manifolds. And as we go towards the last layers, we see that they're influenced by the objective function and learn concepts relevant to the task. Okay, so we have seen about 50 to 70% match of the latent concepts with the human defined concepts. Now the question is, what are the unaligned concepts, which uh, we are unable to define with, or explain with the human defined concepts? We observe that many of these concepts, we can, we, can, we can explain them based on the composition of different concepts. For example, um, we, we saw that a uh, concept may represent semantic and syntactic relationships. So by using two different human defined concepts, we may be able to explain the, the relationship behind the latent concepts. Um, for example, this cluster was not aligned with any of our uh, human defined concept, but to a human, it's quite logical that it has geopolitical entities and their objectives. For example, we have 
um, Sweden, Swedish, uh, we have Finland, Finnish, Brazil, Brazilian. So, so these, they cannot be explained with one human defined concept, but they can be explained with a composition of multiple concepts. This is another example of an online concept where it's, it's, a, it's a concept of verb with a very specific semantics, but all of the verb forms are, um, um, are mixed together into one cluster. Not all, yeah, most, most of them. Yeah, but still other than these underlying concepts, we, we also found some of the concepts that are uninterpretable for, for us at this point. For example, this cluster. Maybe it's a phrasal cluster. Like our current framework of latent concept is limited to, to analyzing the word, analyzing words only. So it could be that at some point in the higher layers model is learning some phrasal properties which are useful for the objective function. And so I'm not saying they are completely uninterpretable, but our current methodology maybe is not. Is, is, is limited to, to understand the, these uninterpretable concepts. Okay, so um, to summarize and some of the thoughts, um, um, I, I present an unsupervised method to probe representations of neural network models, where we cluster the represent, contextualized representations, then we manually annotate them, and then we also align these clusters with the human defined concepts. And, and we have seen that the, the latent space, um, the, if we interpret them, we can, it, it helps us to understand how the model has structured the knowledge of the language. Um, and we have seen that the, the knowledge evolved across the layers from lexical semantic similarities to more core linguistic properties. And then it leads towards the, what is important for the objective function. So there are many, several um, um, applications of, of this methodology of the latent concepts. Um, one, one application could be that they can serve as an intrinsic evaluation method. That where um, we already know some of our known like sensitive attributes like gender, race, or some unknown um, sensitive attributes. By looking at these latent space, we can see how model is is aligning some sensitive concepts with some of the maybe some negative connotations or some extremely positive connotations. And we have we have so, shown in one of the papers that it, it highlights some potential biases. So this is one one practical application of, of um, the model uh, of the latent concepts. Another one is I think it is also very specific to. Um, to this seminar where um, a lot of interest is on the low resource language. Um, um, and we, we, there's a, um, 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 a large like availability of now pre-trained models for many of the low resource languages as well, or multilingual uh, pre-trained models. But many of these languages lack resources like core linguistic resources or WordNet, these kind of things. So, one, um, one way to uh, facilitate the annotation of um, or building the resources for lower source language is that we use the pre-trained models latent spaces, and then we annotate them with this multifaceted kind of information. So we extract latent space of a very lower source language, maybe from layer five, where we know that the space will be way less dominated by the engrams and less dominated by the objective function and we manually annotate them with different uh, linguistic properties and in this way we can we can um, uh, we can we can build resources for these languages um, another um, very important application of uh, these latent concepts is is the explanation of the model so so if we can um, if we can explain which of these latent concepts or latent, uh, has been used in particular predictions, we can explain the prediction of the model based on its internal entrance, internal latent space, which, which can really help us to understand why and how the model reached to this particular decision and how we can actually debug or uh, uh, fix the model. 
So um, that's all. Thank you very much. Here are some of the links. The code is available. We are um, still working on making it much nicer for uh, the community, but feel free to open an issue. Um, I would like to highlight the NeuroX. This is part of the NeuroX project, which is a very comprehensive interpretability, interpretability toolkit. If you want to run probing analysis, you want to identify neurons, you can, you can do it. And um, in a seamless way, it's like available as pip install. Um, and most of the work that I presented is part of these two papers. Um, and rest is the announcement. I'm, I'm happy to take uh, uh, questions. Okay, thank you, Hassan. Very interesting talk. So I'll, I'll open the floor for any questions. Who wants to raise their hand or put it in the chat? If not, I, I'll start off with. So and one thing I, I, I find very interesting, it's a very nice kind of way of looking at latent concepts. Um, one more thing I wondered was that you, you sort of seem to focus on words that have a very single meaning and not look at ambiguous words like your, your bank or your vessels or words like this that have multiple meanings. So I was wondering, did, did you at all look into polysemous words and how they might appear in multiple clusters and how did that affect your results? So we, when the short answer is we, we haven't, but the like but the method and even in our clusters we have we we have these words i mean it's just like we did not look into this but we have seen that based on the context word uh, words do occur into different uh different clusters and you can imagine that at the embedding layer where you it's it's non, it's non-contextualized you will have bank there as mm -hmm. as as one cluster and then as you go higher up, you will see that it will evolve. I mean, I haven't seen it, but I'm, I'm, I'm fairly confident that you will see that it will evolve into multiple clusters. Because we have seen that the most, it's not, it's not uncommon that you find a word occurring in two different, uh, like we have seen this floating point numbers. That mm -hmm. the model is able to learn a, a syntactic difference between these, uh, these two numbers. Yeah, and, uh, and of course, uh, there's also been lots of results where people have been able to cluster the individual um, in-context embeddings using these models and show that at least for polysemous words, you get some kind of clustering that could show different meanings. So you could perhaps look at one of those papers and see if you can first do a clustering into multiple senses of these words. Maybe that would might improve your mapping here. Oh, yes, exactly, exactly. It will also reduce the search space for us, yeah. Okay, um, are there some other questions? Yeah, well, I have a question as well while we're here. Um, so you compared to WordNet. So, you know, WordNet has a certain kind of hierarchy and people have criticized it at times that it's sometimes the hierarchy doesn't make sense. Um, so I was wondering if you at all thought about looking into if the hierarchy makes sense in, in comparison to how WordNet structures things. So like a particular example is um, the role words, teacher and worker and stuff, and how their organization WordNet has been criticized by quite a few authors. So I was wondering if you looked in, into that and if your models had anything in that direction of better ways to structure concepts. Yeah, I mean, this is one of the future work that we really want to do, that we realize it. Um, we, we are always careful in, and because we are coming from more like computational side and we are always careful in criticizing the linguistic uh, um, uh, hierarchy, but the way we see it, that it can at least enrich, then maybe WordNet has some of these, um, this hierarchy, which is not appropriate, but based on the models provided hierarchy, we can, we can at least enrich it. So that's one of the thing, and that's what I was also suggesting as part of the lower source languages as well. That where we can we can use the the latent space of the model to to define a hierarchy that can help us to annotate. It can help us to annotate, or it can help us to correct or enrich already existing um, uh, hierarchies or ontologies. Okay, thanks. 
Any other questions? If I may, go ahead. Okay, sure. Yeah. Uh, hi. Thanks for the um, for the talk. Um, I have a question about the um, layer-wise alignment that you showed. Um, I think some some slides before that. Yeah, this one. Um, for the um, syntactic part in Figure C, we really th see um, the peak performance around relatively high layers, whereas a lot of papers that went more in the direction of probing classifiers found the best like alignment with syntactic concepts in like layers that were a bit lower, like like maybe two or three layers lower on average. So is there a way to like explain this difference? Have, have you looked into that? I mean for syntactic, you may you may realize that I I I, I did not go into the detail of many of the syntactic uh, findings in the so in the paper. So um, I think there is like if, even if you look at the some of the matches, I believe it's one of the limitation of the approach that it's very much focused on word level um, concepts, like how you how you cluster the words. So, so, so I believe that the, uh, we need to to somehow incorporate the the, the syntactic structure into 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 the modeling of the the higher clustering so so I'm, I'm just saying that one that i'm suspecting that there is some some issue with aligning the syntactic categories with the latent uh, concepts that could be one possible issue but at the uh, on the other hand um uh, since the results are very consistent, I'm not always like very confident that there's, there's some problems. So it could be the, the difference between different approaches. Like um, maybe for when you train a classifier, some of the lower layers, the information is way more available for the classifier to decipher and, 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 and perform well, which is different from how the latent space represents. Uh, for example, in, in some of our work, we, we found that if you, if you don't normalize these representations, then many of the, uh, many of the linguistic or their findings are completely different compared to when you normalize this representation and then train a classifier. Because in that case, the, the information is now because the, all of the representation of the waves are not normalized, then the information is way more easily available to the classifier. And then they train, um, they easily show you good performance. So, so the classifier approach has its own cons. And we, we don't know which one is the, the best approach. But here, um, because we are relying minimum on any of the supervision, but still, I believe that there can be some issue with the alignment with the syntactic categories that we need to improve, yeah. Okay. In which case, I'd like to thank our speaker again, a very interesting talk. Um, we'll have next seminar, next, um, next uh, seminar in the series will uh, be in, in a month and it will be, I think, a presentation from um, our team, some of the work we've actually been doing in the Carbon Project. Um, so when we come to this, it'll be announced in all the usual channels. And yeah, I'd like to say thank you, Hassan, and thank you everyone for coming. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. -bye. Bye.